Mastering music is incredibly interesting, and on occasion equally challenging. It's a technical job designed to translate a recording over multiple mediums and systems. It's a creative process that often requires an emotional understanding of the artist's intentions, and it's even a scientific practice that benefits from in-depth knowledge of physics, biology, and even anthropology from time to time. So, in addition to improving my masters through trial and error, I like to review research papers and studies to see if there's anything worth considering during my next session. I've compiled some of the best research that I've found, ranging from psychoacoustic findings to blind studies measuring listener preferences and even some historical data. So, let's jump into audio mastering science, using research to make informed decisions. First, let's consider measured standards for the dynamic range. In a 2014 paper written by Pedro Pastana and Joshua D. Rice and presented at the 53rd AES convention, the authors measured 928 commercially successful songs to see if they could find significant patterns. One finding shows the average dynamic ranges of each octave using a peak to RMS ratio. On average, the lowest range has the most compression, or at least the most controlled dynamic range, with a peak to RMS ratio of roughly 16. Meanwhile, the highest octave has a ratio of about 28. Now, peak is the highest amplitude signal, while RMS is the average loudness over time. By measuring the two and comparing, we could find the crest factor, or amplitude difference, between the peak and RMS values. So the higher this ratio, the greater the distance between the two, so to speak. Represented visually, the crest factor may look something like this for the low frequencies, and the crest factor may look something like this for the high frequencies. As it relates to mastering, I think it makes more sense to group these eight octaves into three distinct ranges. This way any changes made are less audible, or at least more natural sounding, since they occur over a wider range of frequencies. From there, I could use a processor like Isolate, which is free if you want to try this for yourself, and adjust the crossovers to cover these three ranges. After that, I can insert a peak meter and an RMS meter. With the range I want to measure soloed, I'll play the track and measure the peak to RMS ratio to see if it falls in line with the figures recorded in this study. If the ratio is too high for this range, I could compress. If it's too low, I'll expand. Then, I'll adjust the overall response to ensure it stays how I originally intended. Now, this is a bit too time-consuming to do on a regular basis, but trying it at least once is definitely helpful. It lets you know what's somewhat standard for masters, and then you can either adhere to it or deviate from it as you see fit. Let's take a listen to a stereo mix. The first section will have ratios that don't match the study. Then, I'll repeat the segment, but processed to the dynamic ranges listed here. Next, let's cover expected stereo width. So this one is a bit simpler. Mono compatibility is widely popular, at least for the past 40 years or so. Some early stereo records experimented with unconventional instrument panning, but it looks like that died out pretty quickly. Now to find the ratio that they used, they just measured the RMS values of the left and right channels. They found the left and the right channels deviated by 0.8 dB at most. That said, this doesn't mean a mixer or a master can't be wide. It's possible to have identical RMS values in the left and right channels while monitoring only the side image. But this is likely an indication of what we already know. Powerful and important instruments should be center. So the lead vocal, the bass, the kick, and the snare aren't panned, unless for some quick creative effect. As for mastering, it's likely best to avoid any processing that affects the left channel, but not the right, or vice versa. So, equalizing the left and right channels at different frequencies and or to different extents probably isn't for the best. When limiting, it's a good idea to keep the channels linked or mostly linked to avoid attenuation to one and not the other. This way the RMS values of each channel stay within this range. Lastly, stereo expansion to frequencies above 200 Hz is generally acceptable, but when mastering, ensure this is subtle. For that reason, I'd recommend small changes to the side image or the balance between the mid and side images. I wouldn't recommend any stereo expansion that introduces delay or some type of phase interference to accomplish this. By amplifying the side image, we're accentuating the differences that are already there in the mix, not creating more differences 
that could affect those four main centered instruments that I mentioned. Now to show this, let's listen to stereo expansion by equalizing the side image. Then we'll listen to the same segment expanded with a delay based stereo expander. Notice that the second track loses focus as important centered images are widened. Real quick, Sage Audio is an analog mastering studio. We've been around for 20 years, and mastering with us cost $49 a track. There's a link in the description and an ad at the end of the video if you'd like to learn more. Last up, let's talk about preferred reverb levels. I might think reverb only relates to mixing, but the reverb used during a mix session can be greatly impacted during mastering. The preferred level for reverb and other temporal effects is 9 loudness units lower than the dry signal. Notice that most listeners prefer a dry signal over a highly reverberated one, but 9 loudness units below the dry signal is the most popular option for the 30 listeners in this study. Reverb includes a lot of quiet reflections. These are often masked by louder signals. But during the mastering process, the amplification of quieter details via limiting, clipping, compression with makeup gain, or anything that creates a ceiling while pushing the signal higher will greatly increase the perception of reverb. Unfortunately, this is difficult to avoid, especially if you want to achieve a particular dynamic range. Going back to the first section of this video, imagine the mids have a good amount of reverb, but the peak to RMS ratio is a lot higher than we want. We'd have to first control the dynamics of the range, likely with peak compression. And then if we'd want to retain the same frequency response, we'd have to amplify that range to make up for the compression, resulting in the amplification of quieter details. And as we covered, this could make the reverb too noticeable. Unfortunately, there isn't an easy way to measure this relationship, especially when we only have a stereo track to work with. The best option is for the mix engineer to slightly lower the level of reverb and temporal effects to accommodate for their increase during mastering. So let's listen to a drum track on which I've added some reverb, then I'll use compression with makeup gain similar to the processing types that would be used during mastering. Notice how the reverb quickly becomes more noticeable. Get professional analog mastering that accurately translates what you hear in your head. Seriously though, when people work with us, they get results. That's why major industry professionals like Keith Urban's producer Aaron Schurz works with us, Grammy award-winning AJ Castillo, Billboard number one charted artist Megan Lindsay, Grammy award-winning artist Tulis, The Voice singer Cody Ballou, Grammy-nominated producer Tyler Kane, Warner Music artist Ricky Young, and the list goes on. Why waste your time creating masters that don't accurately translate what you hear in your head when you could instantly fix a problem by clicking the link in the description and working directly with professionals who have already done what you're trying to do. We've mastered thousands of songs that accurately translate what each client hears in their head and it'll work for you too. Click the link in the description now and get direct access to us for personalized analog mastering that accurately translates what you hear in your head.